Thanks, Eric. Uh, we really appreciate you uh, joining us for our little car ride. Uh, and uh, can you maybe introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, I'm Eric. Uh, I work at uh, Armea. Armea is a large insurance company in the Netherlands. Uh, I myself uh, are a solution architect uh, working uh, with a team that is providing uh, Linux and Kubernetes on uh, uh, cloud services and cloud service providers, mainly on Azure at this moment. Okay, and so as a solutions architect, that's that's often kind of a sales-related role. Are you doing uh, work mostly for organizations outside of Himea, or is it uh, you know kind of are you doing? It's more like internal consulting or, or something unrelated. Um, it, it should be internal consulting. Okay, uh, but uh, uh, the word architect it, it is always a bit confusing. I think in, in as, in, as in are IT. most titles yeah. in our in our industry. But. <laughs> and I don't know why anybody even. Even invented titles there, but um, the fact is, I think I see myself more as a uh, as a senior engineer within the team. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think a lot of people grow in their job and uh, by doing stuff and doing things. That's my story. I do things. I like uh, uh, software. I like Kubernetes, and in, in that way, I grow uh, uh, in the job where I am. And, it has just has the job title solution on it. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, so I, uh, you know, I think they, you know, we have a lot of people in the kind of software industry who, you know, are just uh, kind of there as a job, right? And other people who, uh, it's also their kind of only hobby. Um, and so, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and so I, I know I've played like all different kinds of roles, you know, uh, with all kinds of different titles. Um, and, you know, I, I've also had multiple roles with different titles where I was doing exactly the same thing. So, you know, okay. it's, it's, it's kind of a weird field, yeah. um, but you know, so what brought you to, you know, have you, have you been in open source kind of land long or have you mostly been kind of working in insurance companies and, and Kubernetes was uh, part of your movement or was there something that drew you into the open source space and, and, you know, kind of in particular unrelated to your job? I think it's a bit in between. So okay. uh, I think uh, I'm not working directly as a contributor in the open source uh, mm -hmm. uh, world. Uh, I do some small contributions when we see them. I think we're mainly a user of open source software, either uh, supported by, for example, Red Hat or mm -hmm. uh, directly in uh, uh, simple Python packages or whatever that, mm -hmm. that is necessary to manage and maintain the infrastructure we provide our, our company. Yeah, yeah. Um, so mainly a user, mainly engineering, mainly deployment. And my job or my journey started uh, in uh, pure commercial uh, uh, Unix systems, AI oh, okay. through 64. Oh, all right. Uh, yeah. I even did some fax VMS, which is a long, long time ago. Yeah. So. I did. Uh, I I did Sun uh, mostly, not AIX, but I actually ran or worked on a system that had a AIX Oracle instance back end. Ah. But I didn't touch that part. I mostly was like Sun OS and yeah. So I, I know of what you speak. Sun OS four dots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I actually had a Spark 10 on my desk, oh, which I was pretty excited about. Me too. For a while. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But I, uh, I did a lot of stuff on that. Different then, times. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> well, then I became a Windows programmer for a long time, uh, randomly. So you know, you, yeah. you go, you go all over the place. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but so when you, so but you kind of grew up around Unix, right? So Unix, having, Linux. Yeah, uh, I, 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 I even started in the Linux kernel the dot uh, dot nine or so. Something okay. that uh, dot nine ninety nine. Um, yeah. And from there on, uh, I started doing everything. Uh, when I en when I entered the enterprise, there wasn't Linux. Right. Uh, right. Or they, open source. Or even open source. No, yeah. that, that was banned. Yep. Um, I remember uh, that. But nowadays, I think the, the, the complete journey from there to where we are now, I, I be, I've been there and most of the time in the AIX, Linux, and nowadays Kubernetes uh, uh, community, mm -hmm. internally. And and it's, um, and so, so, so you had a lot of experience with like proprietary systems yep. and what, what do you feel like is different with the kind of the open source software systems? I mean, you know, I, I'm going to guess maybe you prefer them, but you know, what, what is it about them that you feel like is different or, you know, that may be better or sometimes worse? 
Well, I, I, uh, let's start. I prefer them. Uh, uh -huh. and, and it has a lot of reasons for it, but uh, what the difference, the, the main, I think the main difference between them is that if you look at open source, if you look at the speed of innovation, uh, that's so much different than the commercial uh, software. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that I can uh, help look at the software, uh, understand how it works, helps me use the software. Right. In, in, in all the, in the commercial uh, software we used uh, down the lane, the problem was, okay, it's a big package. It's complex. It's uh, I don't understand it, uh, and I can use probably 10 or 20 percent of it. Right. If I look at the open source software, um, there are so many people that are working uh, around it. I can contact them. I can ask them for help. I can right. look at the documentation. I can contribute. That's the main difference from my side. The, the, the usability. Um, there is a downside, of course. There's always a downside. Yeah. It's choosing. And because there is so much open source software, yeah, what is now, the best solution? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which which step I would do? Where do I go from where I am? How do I migrate? Um, um, commercial software vendors at least help you with that. And right. You right. need to invent uh, that yourself. That means that you need uh, team and team members that have the knowledge and uh, uh, have the opportunity, the time, and also the will to do that. Right, to, to really like dig into yeah, it. Really yeah, to really dig into yeah. it. Yeah. Um, you said a couple of things that I thought were interesting. The, um, you know, I think especially for non, especially non-technical people altogether, but then also people who aren't like deeply technical, I don't think people realize that, you know, the trade-offs that we make when we're developing basically anything all the time, that you just make trade-off, trade-off, trade-off. And I think one of the things that you were kind of commenting on is the the fact that you can really dig into a piece of open source software, you can align your trade-offs with their trade-off choices, definitely, right? Definitely, Which is yeah. huge and can be a huge advantage yeah. that I think people don't, you know, like I said, unless they're they're deeply technical, they don't realize um, can really make a big difference. As you were kind of saying, you know, that 10 to 20%, you know, usage versus, I don't know, maybe 70%, I don't think you ever get to 100, but you know, like, <laughs> but you can, you can definitely take advantage of of that, um, you know, of of that, like I said, uh, similar mindset. You can like make your software think or be, you know, have the same ethos kind of as the software you're relying on, uh, which really makes a big difference. Definitely, definitely. Um, yeah. So I thought that was it's an interesting take. I don't think I've ever uh, really kind of thought about that before. It's like one of the advantages of open source. Um, but that's that's really cool. And uh, so you're mostly now kind of doing uh, open source with Kubernetes uh, or with OpenShift. Um, and so where where do you you know typically work in that space? Are you providing like platforms? Are you actually changing things in the bottom of OpenShift? Are you no. running applications? Are you... Uh, uh, we, uh, we as a team provide platforms uh, to mm -hmm. the Armea IT organization. Okay. Uh, we provide uh, Kube, uh, namespace as a service in, in essence, which is uh, just a simple service that provides the uh, application teams uh, the space to deploy uh, their applications on Kubernetes, mm -hmm. uh, specifically on OpenShift. Okay. Um, and do you provide like a, like a set of tech stacks kind of that are the preferred model or something? Uh, we initially just started with, uh, here's the namespace, do your thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, um, uh, that works, uh, but that only works for teams that do have a high engineering uh, grade. They they, right. they they know what they're doing. They have their knowledge inside. Uh, and they are enthusiastic to uh, think about how they want to use the platform. Um, so we are growing uh -huh. every day. And one of the conclusions in our site is, okay, we have a diversified uh, set of engineers. Right. It's not only a highly, highly skilled engineer, it's all also, people that, uh, well, uh, do have a lot of interest in technology, but maybe not specifically on Kubernetes. Right, right. Um, so to help them adapt the same technology, we need to do we we need to provide different services. So uh, in the near future, we will probably 
start helping them in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of discussions internally. Uh, for example, uh, should you, for example, provide uh, uh, teams of people that enable them, enabling teams, or should you um, diversify in your portfolio? Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the, the road I'm taking is at least uh, both, I think. Yeah, the diversification, it's usually ends up happening. Yeah. Uh, I think diversification in the portfolio is good uh, to help uh, low uh, engineering teams uh, ensure that they can, that they don't need to think about the technology, just help them with deploying an application, mm -hmm. but also the other way around, uh, teams that do one thing uh, like uh, the control, uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, provide them with the functionality uh, to do, to have that control, to uh, do it themselves. Right. So th th that's the road we're taking now, uh, and it will take time, but uh, we're looking, uh, looking forward. So the development teams that you support, uh, yeah. uh, did many of them use container technologies before no. the exposure to Kubernetes? No. So they're kind of like their first exposure is with. Kubernetes yeah. and OpenShift to yeah. containers at all. Yeah, directly. Yeah. 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 So, uh, and, and as mentioned, we, for example, have a team that provides Pega as a as a local platform. Mm -hmm. they, they are very good in Pega, but they, they are probably not as good in uh, technology. They, they, that's not their thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also have, uh, for example, .NET Core teams. Mm. Uh, those uh, teams are heavily involved in development code. They know CI CD pipelines, they know all the stuff, and they uh, they want, for example, you, uh, 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 functionality like Dapper. Uh, they, they are thinking like service meshes should help us. Um, th that kind of teams need a diff have a di different need, need than the Pega teams, for example. Right. Right. Interesting. Um, the and so when they're kind of moving to these containerized services, are you finding that, like, do you do you also need to educate them about, like, how they need to re-architect the applications or change how they approach applications? Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, that, yeah sometimes. Um, re-educate, it's more helping them uh, adapting uh, to that different environment, uh, mm -hmm. helping them understand what the differences are. I think most of them understand and everybody knows that we need to go to cloud. That's right. a, that, right. that's a, that discussion is already finished. Um, but what it means to go to cloud, right. what it means to go, go cloud native, it's, it's a totally different, different story. Yeah, it's yeah. a totally different story, yeah. yeah. Um, and so when you, um, so I was gonna ask you, the, uh, when they're moving, like so are, are you mostly getting adoption through new applications or are you also seeing like, or is there a lot of migration work as well? Both. Both. There's a lot of migration work. There's a lot of life cycle management in the sense that the current application e evolve. Uh, we also see a lot of uh, uh, independent software vendors nowadays move from traditional deployments in Windows or uh, Linux uh, mm -hmm. to uh, uh, Kubernetes based deployments. Mm -hmm. Basically, probably because development in a platform like Kubernetes is much easier. So right, right. well, especially, particularly the deployment side. I mean, it's like you know, I, I like on my laptop, right? I try very hard not to essentially install anything. You know, I just <laughs> put everything in a container that I ever use, so that I don't have to deal with the conflicts. I don't have to deal with you know upgrades where I don't want them. You know, things like that. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I, I think containers have been like at least for me. You know, I've been. Uh, using containers since what, like 2012, I think, you know? Okay. That's, uh, uh, that's early, yeah. I started with containers in 2015 or so. Yeah. So. yeah. Um, well, it helped that I was working at Red Hat, so, um, yeah. the, you Damn. know, that whole Linux <laughs> thing was kind of right there. Um, but uh, the, oh boy, I hate to block the box. Um, it is Amsterdam. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw a bunch of people do it. I was like, <laughs> really? Um, you get, People do not like you in Boston for doing that. No, um, no it is it is uh, it's definitely an affront to uh, all that is good and holy, according to most drivers. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, just do it here. It's, uh, be bold and be brave. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. So, uh, 
with kind of the um, open source world or whatever, is there is there a particular part of kind of that Kubernetes and OpenShift landscape or whatever that you really think is going to be, uh, you know, kind of world changing aside from cloud native in general uh, mm-hmm. for your kind of engineering teams? Like, are, you know, is serverless really going to be a, a really a godsend for them or, you know, kind of thinking about event driven architectures or, you know. What uh, what's it's going to uh, enable? You know that's going to be I really think awesome. The, the, I think the the, the combination of, of a set of functionality will will be game changing. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not one specific uh, change in the common period, um, at least not a, that I know of. Um, what I now see is that the, the possibility to move a lot of functionality to the infrastructure uh, provided for example by Dapper, provided by service meshes, um, provided by Keda. Um, those functionalities ensure that developers can focus themselves on building functionality. Right. right. Uh, for our organization that that's a big game changer. Kubernetes yeah. in itself is, it, 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 it is the cloud platform of the future. Uh-huh. Uh, it even, uh, not even the future, it, it is here right, right now. Right. Uh, adding CRDs like Keda, like uh, Dapper is the, uh, is the next step, uh, the fruit uh, of the labor that uh, developers can use to mainly fun- uh, look at functionality and not anymore on the technology part. Right, right. Um, do you, uh, you know, depending on the organization, you know, uh, do do you see a lot of your kind of development teams, you know, sharing functionality and do you think that, you know, this move to, you know, a little bit more like a service-oriented architecture or using, uh, you know, containers in, in this way, mm-hmm. will this increase the opportunities for, you know, less teams to rewrite the same code? Hopefully, hopefully, yeah, yeah hopefully, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. There are a lot of, and there are a lot of um, uh, uh, good uh, thoughts about that. Mm-hmm. The, the platform engineering uh, movement, of course, the uh, backstage, you know, IDPs, mm-hmm. uh, all things and all functionality that that will help. Um, but it also means that uh, teams need to grow in their own maturity. They need, mm-hmm. need to see what is possible. <coughs> what what. Um, what can be shared between other teams. Uh, so yeah, I, I think that will be the next step mm-hmm. there and uh, uh, that will help uh, us and other teams uh, be more productive. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, no, I that, definitely agree with that one. That also <laughs> means that they need to grow in, in maturity. They need to right. do the first step. First, they need to understand containers. They need to understand developing in that cloud native uh, environment. Yeah, yeah. And and kind of really adopting, you know, I, yeah. I regularly use the word ethos, but like the, you know, the philosophy behind it and the approach, um, you know, because, you know, you, you can, you can do a lot of things just putting it into a cloud native environment yeah. uh, that really are not, you know, going to support like enable any of those things you know you just all you did was a port you know um and i think that's i've seen that yeah done that oh yeah yeah um oh i've i've hacked that myself um but at least i know that i'm doing something horrifying um but i think that's uh the the next that's another big hurdle for a lot of people is like no 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 it's not just you know oh now i'm running my web server in a container and my database in a container i i need to construct my architecture differently, um, you know, which can take a while. But I've so. seen that that, 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 uh, uh, that step is necessary. Mm-hmm. I, I think uh, uh, I can tell everybody that you need don't need to do that, but they will do it. Yeah, uh, yeah. at least once. Uh, at yeah. least once right. and uh, find out that that is not the good way to do it. Right. Uh, people need to learn and learning, uh, most of the time learning the hard way. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, we will help them. Yeah, we are seeing uh, those kinds of patterns, uh, uh, and uh, hopefully we will learn. Right, right. Well, the um, it, you know to to pitch the show, right? So that's kind of the <laughs> idea, like with Cube by Example, right? Is we try to uh, give these like learning paths or whatever that really talk a lot about um, kind of the the f- philosophical aspect and like trying to change how you're thinking. You're not just using a new technology. Um, 
you know, one of the, one of the common ones I see for that is like, um, people, you know, I've talked to people about Kubernetes and they're like, well, why do I need this big honking, you know, piece of software, uh, to, to run my environment? And I'm like, well, have you used containers much? And they're like, no, no, I haven't. I'm like, use some containers, like get used to them. And then you will discover how quickly you need something to orchestrate them because you can't keep track of where they all are, what, yeah. what's current, what's, true, you know, true, you know true, yeah. um, it's, uh, it's really interesting, you know, or like, you know, I think the, the prior art on this is essentially if you had an environment that used like golden image VMs, yeah. um, which is also was kind of a game changer, but changes how you think about what you're doing as well. Um, and, uh, you know, that had a lot of, uh, trouble in and of itself. <laughs> you know, um, and I think containers are like, let's, let's multiply that by a factor of 50, you yeah. know, um, which is always kind of interesting. Um, but the fact of the matter is Kubernetes itself is hard mm -hmm. and finding people that do understand it and knowing it is, is, uh, is a lot harder. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I deal with, cause I, you know, I teach at a university and, you know, I deal with this in, with students every day like you know I have to I have to start them with okay why don't we just run everything on physical hardware you know um, and you know and I talk about the you know retail season or tax season or you know something that shows them a big spike and so you have to buy all the <laughs> hardware you know and then I kind of walk them into density around you know virtual machines and then I'm like okay but that's still got all this overhead you know and then I walk them into containers and usually they kind of sort of get it when I get to the container part oh, but it's like love to, <laughs> to to be in that class <laughs> yeah yeah it's uh it, it's just it's like what i think especially i think both of us you know uh, kind of grew up with yeah. a lot of this yeah definitely. and i think uh like i don't recognize how complex it is now because i've been slowly getting it added to my plate yeah, but, you know over the <laughs> years fact, and, yeah. and you look at somebody I mean, now and they're like Here's this huge, monstrous, complicated. Good thing. luck. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You can you can learn it on your yeah, own. It'll be probably fine. Probably will drown, or, or <laughs> right. maybe you will swim. Right. It, right. We will see. Yeah, no, yeah. true, true. It, it is a journey, and you need uh, a part of that. You need to do the a part of that journey to understand why we are where we are. Right, right. And I think it's like it's it's like a lot of things, right? You have to feel some of the pain yep. to be able to understand the solution, you know. Um, but at the same time, you know. So especially like in you know corporate enterprise or whatever like how how often can you afford to uh, let somebody deal with the pain right um, and so that, that's a big that, that, that's true that's a big concern I think the enterprises at least the enterprises I know are keen on control they, they want to provide they want to deploy applications in such a way that that, that faults uh, that it, there are no faults there are no problems but but in, uh, the fact of life is that there are always issues, that there are always Oops. problems. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think it's, I don't know, I, like I said, I think it's good for people to get, to, to feel some of the pain. You know, we were talking in another interview earlier, like one of my, uh, one of my things that I really dislike about how we hire in the industry yeah. is like, oh yeah, I need a person who has Python, uh, you know, for 10 years <laughs> and has used module A and B and C. And it's like, no, what you need is somebody who knows how to code, and then you need to give them an opportunity to learn the environment in which you're in. Yeah, do it, um, yeah. Uh, and, you know, it's like, cause I know how to write a for loop, I can figure out how to do it in Python, whether I know the language or not. You know, um, it, you know, might I might be a little slow to start, um, but I think it's true for a lot of, uh, especially these kind of high level technologies. You know, if, if we go out and just try uh, to hire only Kubernetes experts, you're not going to hire anybody. No. You know? um, <laughs> no, 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 no. There will be no, no, no. Right. And so I think that's uh, one of the big challenges I think with our industry. I actually think it's a big part of it is that um, a lot of the times the kind of hiring arm of yeah. the organization doesn't really understand what they're hiring um, and so they can't use you know their skill set to most effectiveness because they don't entirely get what they're trying to hire um, and, 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 and but it's also difficult uh, uh, oh yeah, uh, yeah. Um, uh, when we uh, when we talk to uh, potential employees and mm -hmm. have a discussion with them um, you must write down what you what you expect from somebody, and that's that's a set of bullets. It's right. not more, and that, but it never grasps the real 
right the you crux want, of what you're looking yeah. for yeah that's the first step and then you have an interview with with somebody right. it's 10 minutes or 15 minutes or 30 minutes to, to interview somebody and then you need to decide okay is he good enough for us is he is, right. he, is he does he want to grow what kind of person do we do we talk about it so um love to do it i yeah. love to talk with a lot of people but it's um it's not yeah yeah. Um, so uh, I think that that has both uh, that has two sides of the medal, and the, uh, the side of the uh, uh, potential employee, and of course the hiring, the, the one that needs somebody uh, interacting with each other and uh, grasping what we really need. Uh, and then is the other part. Uh, I'm not sure what it is in America, but in the uh, universities and the, the schools here in Europe, at least in the Netherlands, um, it's uh, the, the ones that come from school do not ha really have uh, uh, skills in the sense that they, they know something, they right. learn something, they learn to adapt, uh, but they uh, uh, they need to. Uh, change when they go to the uh, organization. Well, it's a like, totally different environment. So it's one of the things that uh, we actually try to cover in some of the classes we teach. Is you know, it's like generally speaking, if you do like a computer science or even a data science yeah. uh, kind of major, um, you learn like how to code, right? Yeah. But you don't really know how to do software building. Which is not the same thing, you know. Um, you know, and you know, so that's we we've been, you know, we've kind of introduced these classes where we do like projects for third parties, and like we make sure that the projects that they do, like one of my requirements is that the the student team has to deploy something by the end of the semester. Okay. Um, and part of the class is them gathering requirements and expectation setting uh, from the uh, you know the client and making sure that they deliver they set a, an expectation and then they deliver on that expectation yeah um, and 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 one of the things the students have a really hard time with is like I can't tell you at the beginning of the semester what it means to get an A what I can tell you is is that if the client feels like you met their expectations you get an A and so that means you have to understand that you have to work with them to figure out what they are expecting you to build and then build it yeah. and then deploy it, which is all things that don't really have anything to do with computer science, you know, um, which is, uh, you know, interesting. Uh, and, and yeah, part of, uh, part of what makes the teaching those classes difficult <laughs> to put They're them nice. out. Like, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure what the approach is here in the Netherlands. It's, it, it sounds different. Uh, I had a, Guy that um, did a uh, st uh, um, uh, st which is in Dutch stage. I'm not sure what what the English word is. Um, and he was he had an assignment to do something for a specific uh, organization, um, but he's put there. He has a uh, uh, he has a guy that guides him through it, uh, but in the end, it's all about the assignment and not about um, having a good discussion on what the organization itself needs. No, oh, yeah, yeah. It, it's a different approach, I think, but it, it probably depends on the uh, the school. Well, and I mean, I would say the way we're doing this is is not particularly standard for um, you know software you know, or computer science programs in the US either, um, you know, because, you know, at the end of the day, right, it, you go, typically you go to a university because yeah. you are actually expecting to go more into like the, the academic side of whatever that field is. Um, and, you know, it's kind of a, it's a different subject matter to learn how to go do it in practice. Yeah, um, and, uh, you know, and I think that, that, the challenge, I don't actually think that's a bad thing to teach it. I think the problem is that there's an expectation mismatch by some of the students <laughs> and by what they're, you know, kind of walking away with, um, you know. So, whatever. Different, but, yeah. different, yeah. different. Um, it, nice if I get around this corner, but I... Yeah, yeah so. and we need to go to the uh, right. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I was... Uh, 
kind of meandered a little bit off of our normal path because <laughs> it's funny as I get better at the at the route it takes less time oh. right <laughs> you know because there's a less uh, of me trying to figure out where I'm going where, where uh, you yeah. are so uh, yeah a I lot to, of a lot of issues here in Amsterdam yeah, with the yeah. traffic it's exciting yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, I'm not sure if it is different in Boston or uh, Detroit oh it's it's pretty similar we don't have the bikers but we have ah. pedestrians uh, in the same vein um, ah. so you know but I mean, we have bikers too, but not to this volume. <laughs> um, so, but yeah. No, that's uh, that will be un unique for Netherlands probably. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but it's good to see. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for uh, your time, and no we problem. really appreciate doing our little drive around Amsterdam interview. Um, I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, definitely, yeah. definitely. Yeah. Yeah, I hope you enjoyed to talk too, and thank yeah. you very much yeah. for having. Not me. too many harrowing experiences, I hope. Yeah, <laughs> I'm still in one pod. So. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs>